uh, within the Sankhya philosophy, one of the six uh, classical philosophies of India. Um, it is ubiquitous in modern Indian life and culture. And what is important for you to know about the Triguna theory here is that it describes the states of mind and its interactions with the external objects and situations. We have um, basically three gunas, the idea uh, of uh, sattva, rajas, and tamas, and we'll talk a little bit about it in the next slide. But uh, Clouded thinking, fatigue, depression. Uh, we're all subject to these three. They're they're constantly changing. So it's not that I am uh, somebody in, in Sadhva, Rajasthan, Thomas, but I constantly change between these. Everything that is around us, also besides besides the gunas being uh, states of mind, we can also see that they're uh, they're 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 the basic uh, components of the world around us. So things like music, actions, people, everything around us uh, is made up of these, and these affect our states of mind. So. Pedal, battleship. Okay, very good. Somebody doesn't know what battleship is. <laughs> okay, good, at, at, least, at least that. So um, the idea is that in Battleship, you have a screen, and every single point in that screen has two uh, coordinates, right? The X and Y, right? So if I, wanted to have, um, if I wanted to do it in three dimensions, what do I do? X, Y, Z, right? And so every single point around it, every, every single point, I can describe it by x, y, z coordinate, right? Okay, so fair enough. Now, what if instead of saying x, y, z, I decide to have sattva, rajas, and tamas, right? Okay, and have it go from zero to 100%. So now, every single point in my space will be a combination of these three. <laughs> every single possible combination that I can think of will be a point in this space. Now, if I further ask that sadva plus rajas plus tamas equals 100%, so that it makes sense, so that I don't end up with something that is 300%, right? Uh, then I actually limit everything to just a triangle, a two-dimensional triangle. So that, that makes things easier. Now, uh, I can say that, let's say that, that my mental state at any point, at, at any uh, point in time is, is here. Like, uh, we have here the, this, this red dot that I call it just the self-state. And I can be here at this moment, you know, uh, maybe if you're, you know, because we just had lunch, maybe you'll be drifting, you know, towards this Thomas here, <laughs> right? The idea is that uh, it, the, the points that are near here are more in sattva, rajas, and tamas. So I, I can, you know, I'll fluctuate along this, you know, throughout the day, throughout the years, whatever. Uh, but besides that, there is the fact, you know, that I, what I call attractors. You can have something like a food attractor, right? Uh, or you can have something like a music attractor. Basically, anything that we come in contact will become an attractor towards that place. So, you know, uh, we just had a very delicious sattvic uh, food. So that will bring us a little bit, you know, more towards sattva. Uh, if we if we go out and somebody is going going by with a car, you know, and it's blasting, you know, like um, you know, I don't know, Rage Against the Machine or something like that. <laughs> Nothing against it. Uh, you know, you'll be you'll be prone to the other the other gunas, you know, just because you came in contact with it. So uh, what happens is that uh, there is a force, 
there's a force here that, that is pulling us towards that. And what I did is I made a very simple uh, formula up here uh, to talk about that. It's a very, very simple formula. And I, all you need to know about this formula and is that it talks about the direction, you know, that it goes from my state to that attractor, that it has a specific strength S, so maybe, who knows, maybe food uh, will attract me in, um, in a different degree than uh, a book will do, you know. Uh, maybe also it, it will talk about how the further away I am for, from, um, from a specific uh, attractor, the, the more difficult it will be. So for example, uh, in the morning, I, I go out running. And you know, it's, it's morning, it's, it's sattva, and like that. When I come in uh, to, to have breakfast, I want to have maybe a light breakfast. You know, orange juice, toast, like that. I don't want like something uh, like a big piece of pizza. <laughs> You know, uh, because that's, you know, the, the mode is far away from me at this moment. But maybe in the afternoon or evening, that piece of pizza may really look good. <laughs> Just because now I'm in a different place in this place. So the further away uh, one, one of these attractors are, the, the less the strength, right? And uh, finally, uh, there in, in this formula, there is something called that, that I call inertial mass. Basically, for me to be able to move, it will take a certain, in, you know, I have a certain inertia to be, to be pulled out from my, from my present place. So I call that I. Uh, having set up this, uh, I tested the model uh, using, uh, uh, sorry, I tested the model using uh, published work by David Wolf. He, um, he had a, a very nice experiment, uh, which was, uh, um, I, I'm not going to go very much into it, but basically it was the, the effect of the Maha Mantra on measuring the gunas. Uh, we did a computer simulation of this, and uh, we came out with these, uh, with these results that, that you see here, uh, which were very, very close to what he got experimentally with, uh, with, with uh, human subjects. So now, uh, basing on this, we're, we're going to see how we can use that to, to talk about the mathematical model of the buddhi, the intelligence. Or in other words, the decision making. Why? Because intelligence is the mental process of uh, discrimination, knowing what is to be done, what is not to be done, right? Um, in decision theory, uh, it already has mathematical models. There's already there's already a, a whole branch of economics that is called decision theory, and they have mathematical models to describe how we make decisions, and also how to make decisions. So what we did is we took uh, one of these uh, models on how we make decisions. Uh, it's called the Leaky Competitive Accumulator, LCA for short, right? Uh, try to say that three times in a row. And, uh, uh, what, what, what it is uh, is this um, idea that if, you, if you're going to make a choice, you're going to start looking at the different options that you have. And as you accumulate information about these, um, uh, about these uh, things that are coming, then uh, some, some of them you know, will start looking better and some of them will start looking worse like that. So in here, what you see, oh, sorry. Uh, what you see is uh, three options going uh, in time. This is the, the time coordinate right here, down. Uh, and one of the options starts going up and up, and as, at a certain point, there's a threshold. When, when, this, um, when, when, this when, when any of the options hit this threshold, the first one to hit it, will, that's the one that you say, like, okay, I'm going to take that decision. So now, an, an interesting thing is that, uh, well, let me, an interesting thing about these models is that even though they are very good at describing many things uh, about the, the experiment itself and, the, and, and us, the, uh, they never talk about what, what is around us, you know, how the environment affects us. So, and we know that the environment affects us definitely and strongly. If you don't have your coffee in the morning, 
you know, that, that, that may affect your decision. Or if you spill it over yourself as you're going into a, into a meeting, that is going to, well, call it, um, you know, not coffee, well, whatever. Uh, if, you, if you go into, into that meeting, it, it's, going, um, it, it's going to affect the way that you, that you make the, your decisions. Or uh, every advertisement industry, they know, put a beautiful girl next to a whatever, and you're going to get more money, <laughs> right? So now what we did is we took the LCA model that, that I showed you previously, and we incorporated this, um, uh, th these uh, gunas. So uh, ju we just took some of the, some of the parameters uh, that, that they had, and we just tweaked them with, with the gunas. What that, uh, what that gave us is the ability to start uh, including uh, something that, that is from the environment outside to the inner environment. The gunas talk, allows us to talk about the external environment in terms of tamas, rajas, and, and sattva, and to talk about our mental states in those same terms. So now you have a very simple connection. So this is a, this is a very, uh, very powerful tool to talk about the external environment affecting our in internal environment. And now that we are able to uh, tweak the, uh, the little parameters in the model, now we can talk about the model including the external effects of the environment. Things like uh, the loss aversion curve, where a person can decide, uh, well, you know, it, this is too risky for me to, 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 uh, to, to put money into. You know, can be uh, very much diverted by where you are in the guna triangle. If you're more in the sattva, you know, you're going to be more um, averse to losses. But if you go, if, if you're affected, you know, by, by rajas, you're going to go more into saying, like, I don't care. I just, I, I just need to do this. So if you, uh, if you want to be the most, um, uh, the most logical decision maker, what this shows is you, you better try to go into sattva and surround yourself around things that are sattvic. Uh, I will leave you now with just this um, uh, quote by Euclid called, the laws, of mathematical, the laws of nature are but mathematical thoughts of God. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? We have two minutes. Yes. Okay. So uh, the question is: Can you f uh, also talk about this in terms of uh, repulsion? Uh, yes, we we can we can talk about repulsion here uh, because uh, you know somebody that may be uh, in in very much in uh, sattva may be repulsed by things that are in tamas. So th th this distance, you know, is, is real there. Uh, and and uh, there, there can be uh, a law of repulsion there, yeah. You don't do it in this one, but you could add that. Yes, we could add that. Yes. Yes, yes, you know, if I, if I take this, you know, and throw it around the people here, you know, I'll definitely get a different, you know, I'll, I'll change my environment, will, which will also change me. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, can, I can definitely make, make the, the, the world. <laughs> Sarah? Can we can we just change it with our minds? Is that the question? Uh, according to the to the Yoga Sutras, uh, yes, the, there is a there is a point when, uh, but it, it does require like incredible amounts of uh, practice uh, and training. Um, kids don't try this at home, uh, but uh, you 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 can get to the point where where you go into the Tanmatras, into the Gunas themselves, and change everything to to be able to do it around um, yeah, and have superpowers. Yes. Thank you very much.
much, Mauricio. Thank you. <coughs> um, and I, I should mention that uh, Mauricio will be speaking um, as part of the plenary tomorrow, and um, there will be a lot more opportunity to interact with him. So I'm sure there's many more questions that you'd like to place to him. I'm now going to invite Dr. Jonathan Banks. Um, he got his PhD in geology, um, and he's situated up in the University of Alberta in Ad Edmonton. So the reason he's here is because it's warmer. Um, and he should know about warmth because he heads up um, their department on um, uh, geothermal uh, sustainable heating. So it's, uh, however, he's going to be talking about another subject closer to his heart because he has quite a, a range of uh, talents and he likes to be known, he's got his new cards, Geomancer. <laughs> So um, this topic today and, uh, is, does modern science falsify Vedic claims about the age of the universe? So, Jonathan. Oh, there you are, behind me. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in addition to having a, a, a doctorate degree in geology, I also have a master's degree in science education and a bachelor's degree in geology from the University of Florida, our very own University of Florida, how about that? Uh, and I, as was mentioned, I'm here to talk to you or to ask the question, does modern science falsify Vedic claims about the age of the Earth? The answer is no. There's an asterisk, so you can all go home now. No, uh, there's an asterisk there, I hope you see the asterisks, and we will revisit the asterisks in a few minutes, in, well, let me just, in 15 minutes to be exact. Uh, the next question, why are we talking about geology in a conference on science? The answer to that question is, I don't know. Um, actually, the answer to that question is our friend Bob here has been hounding me for years to engage in this topic. And, you know, geology is about rocks. I study rocks and water. It doesn't necessarily directly lend itself to discussions on consciousness. Um, but it is human nature to ask, wh who are we, where are we, what are we doing here? And our most immediate field of reference for doing that is the Earth. So I'm going to discuss this topic in, uh, on a factual content basis, but I'm actually using the topic as sort of a case study to how to think scientifically about these questions. Who are we, where are we, what are we doing here? Uh, and so I put together this little diagram. Starting here in the most subtle form here is consciousness. We are all conscious beings. Our consciousness then leads to sense perception. Uh, sense perception starts to materialize in an even more, what's going on with my clicker here? Starts to uh, materialize in an even more gross form through observation. So perception is sort of like a blanket background awareness. Observation is, as we heard uh, this morning uh, from Dr. Wright's, um, is focus, we're shining a light on a specific thing, we're wanting to see specifically how something is working. This then bridges into the scientific method. The scientific method is something that has been codified over centuries. Uh, we are not the proprietors of the word science. We do not get to define what science is if we want to be taken seriously in a scientific context. This is a well-defined thing. The scientific method is a well-defined thing. And science is not necessarily equivalent with knowledge. I think this is an important point. Science as a body has factual content in it, but more importantly, science is a process for understanding our environment. And that leads then to empiric knowledge. Uh, here on the lower end of the spectrum, these things are all personal, subjective, and qualitative. We've discussed this sort of ad infinitum over the last night and today. As we move up in the chain, these things here this involves quantification and consensus. Science also is a consensus building process. It's not that I have an idea, here it is. Science involves peer review and it involves groups of people coming together and collaborating to define the empiric knowledge that we're looking at. Uh, what is the bridge here? I think this is where the focus of much of our conference is, is how do we build this bridge from observation, which is subjective, and personal to the scientific method. And in many ways, this is done through mathematics. Well, I'm going to click again. Mathematics is a language that sort of builds a, uh, a level playing field for how we observe things. The way I add one and one together is going to be the same as the way you add one and one together, regardless of how we perceive red and blue. So mathematics is sort of an underpinning language that builds this bridge between observation and the scientific method. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. 
to get into some of the factual content about the scientific views of the age of the Earth, I've just put together a little history lesson. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the notes of this PowerPoint. Uh, anyway, uh, natural science and natural philosophy used to be very tied together. The idea that science and religion were co-collaborators in a search for truth is not new to this room. It actually was very much in vogue during the late Renaissance, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and the original people who first started to try to date the earth were all members of the clergy. The most famous one here is uh, the Bishop James Usher, who is the Archbishop of Ireland in the 1600s. Uh, a lesser known guy, but working around the same time was a man named by the name of John Lightfoot. They both took the Bible and tried to reconstruct biblical chronology to find out when the earth was formed. Uh, Usher was very exact. He said that the Earth was formed on the evening of March 22nd, 4004 BC. And I know there are some Jews in the room, of course. In Judaism, the day begins in the evening, so the first thing we get to do every day is go to sleep. And so that's why it starts in the evening here. Uh, Lightfoot worked uh, around the same time as Usher. He came up with a slightly earlier date. Both of these dates are extremely recent, and we actually have archaeological evidence and other scientific evidence that would falsify these claims. Uh, this was not just a matter of looking through the Bible and so-and-so begat so-and-so and lived so many years. This involved very careful studies of classics and astronomy and history, and so this was actually, at that time, given the information available to these people, these were actually very rigorous academic undertakings. Fast forward a couple hundred years, we get uh, the very well-known Baron Kelvin William Thompson, uh, most well-known for discovering the temperature of absolute zero um, and the Kelvin temperature scale. But he also made a couple assumptions about how the Earth was formed. He hypothesized that when the Earth formed, it was a completely molten bowl of, uh, ball of rock. And then he calculated, based on known thermodynamic principles of the time, how long it would take the Earth to cool under those conditions. He derived an age of about 20 to 40 million years old, which, dang this thing, of uh, 20 to 40 million years old, which again, according to modern geology, is actually a very young age. Um, he did not have accurate information concerning many of the physical properties of the rocks. They did not have, for example, calorimeters. A calorimeter is a machine that measures the heat capacity of a substance. They didn't have those in the 1800s. They weren't invented until near the very end of his lifetime. They also had no knowledge of radioactive decay of substances, so he drastically undercalculated the heat of the Earth, which led to this artificially young age of the Earth. With the discovery of modern radioactivity and in the uh, inorganic scientific context, this is often attributed to a guy named Ernest Rutherford. Of course, we know many other people were working on radioactivity at the time, the Curies and so forth. Uh, he discovered that these things deteriorate over time and that radiogenic materials have half-lives, and I'll talk about half-lives in a moment. He suggested to this guy, B.B. Boltwood, who I think worked at Yale, correct me if anybody knows if I'm wrong, he suggested that we apply these principles of radiogenic decay to absolutely date the age of rocks. Previous to this, we could only have relative dating of rocks. We could st uh, correlate strata geologic strata across the world, and we could see where strata lined up, but we couldn't place any absolute ages onto these stratas. He suggested to his friend Boltwood, hey, you should try to do this on some rocks and see what happens. And he did that. And that led to the development of radiometric dating processes. So radiometric dating, this is the equation for radioactive decay. If you know anything about mathematics, this is a standard exponential decay equation, where y here is what we measure of the mass of a particular isotope in a rock sample or a water sample or whatever you have. Uh, y sub zero, why not, as this, why not, I didn't do that on purpose, uh, represents the, in, uh, the initial uh, mass of that isotope in the rock. And we assume, so there's an assumption here, uh, we assume that that's always full. Uh, and then E is the natural logarithm, K is the radiogenic decay constant. I'm going to return this thing to Office Max as soon as this talk is done. K, K is the radioactive decay constant, and T is time. So if you know K, and you know why, and you know why not, you can solve for time. And that's how things are dated. I'm going to... Uh, this graph down here in the lower corner, we've all heard of the periodic table of elements. This is the periodic table of nucleides. And so this has not only elements in it, but it has all of the possible isotopes of all of the elements that we know on it. 
uh, I don't know if you can see it with the resolution, but there's a black line that runs down the middle of that graph. That black line represents stable isotopes. Those are isotopes that will not decay. Iron, for example, silica doesn't really decay much. And then the color coding on either side represents the type of decay that these elements undergo as they become stable. Uh, just above that we have, this shows the principle of a half-life in an initial state. Everything is what's called a parent isotope. I'm going to talk about uranium isotopes in a moment. And then as the uranium decays, it creates what are called daughter isotopes. Uranium has lead, uh, different isotopes of lead as a daughter isotope. And you can see after one half-life, you have half as much uranium and the other half of uranium turned into lead. And then after two half-lives and so on and so forth, you get this exponential decay function. These are some down here in the bottom, these are some common radiometric clocks as they're called. And you can see if you have a rough idea, again with this thing here, let me see if I do this. If you have a rough idea of how old something is you want to date, you can pick the right clock. When we date, uh, it, for example, in an archaeological context, a mummy or, uh, you know, a ruin of something, we typically use carbon dating. As we go down the chain, you can see down here uranium, this is the 238 isotope of uranium, decays to lead 206, and this has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. So this is a very useful uh, radiogenic clock for dating things that we believe to be very old, like the Earth. Uh, putting all this evidence together, uh, up here we have the, uh, some macroscopic pictures of the mineral zircon. Zircon is a very useful element for uranium dating because it, sometimes the zircon in the element is replaced by uranium. And you get this decay line here. This is called a Concordia line. If you have rocks and they all plot along this line, you can uh, easily plot where the age of it is. If they don't all plot a line, you have a thing called disc uh, Disconcordia, which I won't get into now. You can ask me about it later because I'm running out of time. These are some microscopic zircons that were found by a professor here at the University of Florida in India in the Simboon Crichton. He found a zircon in these rocks that was over four billion years old. Um, and here we have some pictures of very old rocks. This is in the Northwest Territories up by where I live. This is the Acastanice. It's been dated repeatedly by many different researchers to be over 4.2 billion years old. That's what the GA stands for here, giga annum. Uh, below that is the Jack Hills in Australia where they found zircons that are over 4.4 billion years old. But the real evidence lies in the middle picture here. This is a meteorite, a very particular type of meteorite called a chondrite. Uh, chondrites are believed to have undergone no chemical differentiation from when they formed and therefore are believed to be the oldest pictures of the universe, of, sorry, of the solar system that we have. Uh, below that is a chart of where ages of these chondrites plot and they, you can see them all clustered at around 4.5 billion years. And that's why modern science says that the age of the earth is 4.5 to 4.6, uh, 4.54 to 4.56 billion years old. Comparing that with the Vedic version, uh, many of us may be aware that the Vedas speak about time in cycles. And so there are sets of cycles here. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because I think it's familiar to many, many of us. Uh, but basically we have yugas. The yugas add up to a maha yuga. A thousand maha yugas equals a day of Brahma. A day of Brahma is about 4.3 billion years old. So that is kind of close, not exactly close, but pretty close. However, we're not finished with the Day of Brahma. We're about halfway through it. So in reality, we're at about 2.2, 2.3 billion years in this current age of Brahma, if, uh, current day of Brahma. If we look at the whole span of the life of Brahma, we have 100 years of these day and nights. Brahma will live for 311 trillion human years. And so does modern science falsify that claim? We're about halfway through Brahma's life right now, one, uh, 155 trillion years. Does modern science falsify that claim? No, it doesn't. Not in the same way it falsifies the claim that the Earth is 6,000 years old. I can show you so much evidence that'll disprove the idea that the Earth is 6,000 years old. I can't show you any evidence that would disprove that it's 155 trillion years old. So how do we reconcile these things? The short answer, I don't know. Let's think about it. There's a couple issues when we want to compare with the Vedic cycle, we need to ask where in the Vedic cycle are we trying to compare this to? Are we comparing it to a day of Brahma, a day and night of Brahma, the life of Brahma? I don't know, you need to pick your battle. On the scientific side, there's always the question asked, how have constants of radioactive decay changed over time? Well, we can say that if they've 
slowed down over time, meaning they were faster in the distant past, they would have given off a lot of more heat per unit time. And so the Earth kind of would have been cooked if they were a lot faster than they are now. If they're a lot slower than we are now, we would be receiving artificially young ages of the Earth, which would support the Vedic hypothesis, but we don't know. Since these radiometric clocks have been generated, we have not observed any significant statistical change in their rates within human time spans. Uh, so here's another question for you to take home and consider. If the Vedic claims are true, what sort of evidence would we expect to find? And what kinds of tests can we develop to uncover this evidence? And this is kind of the take home message that I have for you. And here we have my asterisk again. Until a suitable means of testing the Vedic hypothesis can be developed, the Vedic claim is not a scientific claim. Science needs to be a testable hypothesis. That doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It means it doesn't fall under the purview of science as it's commonly defined in our world. So we should be aware of that when discussing philosophy with people. Are we discussing philosophy or theology or are we actually discussing science? And the same is true with studying consciousness. What are the hypotheses what are the reliable and valid tests to prove those hypotheses, and what predictions can those hypotheses make? Until we are able to formulate our ideas about consciousness in these terms, I don't think it's accurate to be talking about the science of consciousness. We're still dealing with philosophy and theology. So I leave you with this little bit of a challenge, how to bring all of these discussions we've been having today deeper into the realm of science where we can test and measure these things, if that's our intention. Personally, I don't care. We'll keep chanting Hare Krishna anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. We got, got, got time for one question? Just yell it out before he gets up here. Yeah. But if it can't be tested, it's not science. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. So maybe it lies somewhere in the, in the gray area of that line I drew between, uh, okay, fair enough. All right, I'm gonna get off the stage now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jonathan. All right, I move you on now. We're moving from uh, different parts of the universe. Um, and I'm now going to invite Fedor uh, Vodolowski, who's um, a doctorate, um, got his doctorate in engineering uh, sciences. He's based at the Ural Federal University in Ekaterinburg in Russia. So he's one of the ones who's traveled some of the most distance. Um, we have a, little, a, a wonderful contingent from uh, Russia and Ukraine and very grateful to have them here. So um, Fedor is the first one we're going to hear from. Um, he's doing research on uh, material science, particularly in titanium, and he's going to talk to us about the correlation between material science and the Vedic system of sounds. Fedor. Let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm associate professor in Ural Federal University, and the main topic of my the main topic of my research uh, uh, is uh, material science and crystallography of titanium-based alloys. Uh, also, I study uh, I study Vedas, and uh, uh, during working on my main studies, I found some uh, interesting correlation. Um, between crystallography and the Vedic system of sounds. And now I want to share um, this result with you. Uh, before I start, I have some problems with <laughs> English speaking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, if I will have difficulties during uh, speaking, I will ask my colleague Adi Usmanov to help me. 
uh, 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 well, uh, let's go. Uh, Dr. Hammerfold, uh, Hammerhoff uh, said yesterday uh, uh, there is uh, about wave nature of quantum uh, particles. Uh, so many scientists is agree that uh, there are only vibration on the subatomic level. Uh, imagine uh, that uh, structural units, units of materials world uh, have wave nature. And this interrelation is obvious. But uh, do the interrelation exist on the atomic level? And the answer is yes. Uh, there is a traditional uh, crystallography approach uh, using 14 types of uh, Bravais lattice. Um, uh, these types describe atomic positions of, uh, in, the, uh, in the space. And for example, uh, in metals, uh, there are three main uh, lattices, uh, uh, two of them cubics, uh, third uh, hexagonal. And um, they are ordinary, uh, have uh, two, three, uh, four, and six uh, fold of symmetry. What does it mean? Uh, the uh, two fold of symmetry uh, means that after rotation on the 180 degrees, uh, the atomic moves on to the same position. And uh, for example, uh, for the uh, uh, three font of symmetry, the angel is uh, 120, uh, and so on. Uh, cubic has uh, four fold of symmetry, and uh, hexagonal has uh, six uh, fold of symmetry. But uh, this approach has some difficulties with uh, describing lattices with five, five uh, fold uh, of symmetry. Uh, they called missing solutions. Uh, by example, uh, but examples of such materials exist. Uh, the most popular example of them you can see on the screen, uh, fully Um How uh, we can fill the third space? Uh, the problem is how we can fill the third space without voice using such elements. Uh, and uh, the answer is you must uh, use another approach. Uh, Five-fold symmetry is comparable with transition, but only in one direction, and this this is a problem. You can uh, share this um, lattice on this whole space. Um, another approach. Uh, uh, Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, a few scientists all over the world uh, solve this problem. In Russia, for example, there is two scientists who makes um, who make uh, research on this topic. One of them PhD in technical science, uh, Kropotkin, and uh, second Talis, a PhD in physics and mathematics. So they are a good example of collaboration between them. And uh, I. Uh, um, and take the facts that they used in uh, uh, his research and uh, add some new interpretations. The problem, uh, next slide. Uh, uh, the problem was five-fold uh, fond uh, symmetry. The solution is to uh, how uh, we uh, can The solution is to increase the, the dimension. For example, uh, how uh, you can fill the plane with pentagons? You can see that uh, there is a gap between pentagons. Uh, how, to, uh, how to do this without gaps? Uh, the, answer, the answer is, uh, next slide please. The transition from uh, two-dimensional space to three-dimensional allows uh, us to remove the gaps between the pentagons. Uh, this uh, figure is called dodecahedra. And next slide, please. Uh, like the rotation of two-dimensional pentagons in three-dimensional space, the gap between the polyedra can be eliminated by rotating the three-dimensional uh, 
polyhedron in a four dimensional space. Uh, and the question, uh, how to organize and describe four dimensional space and uh, using the mathematics of complex numbers. Next slide, please. We cannot see uh, four dimensional space, but, what, but we can uh, see the section of four dimensional space by three dimensional reality. For example, there, uh, there is uh, they, such figures called polytops. Uh, uh, this is a uh, four-dimensional four cube, uh, his projection on the three-dimensional uh, reality, and this is a four-dimensional sphere. Uh, and this is a projection of four-dimensional dodecahedron. Uh, uh, <laughs> atoms are situated on the surface of these figures. Uh, Moreover, in uh, the end of the 1980s, the Japanese scientist uh, Aizu proposed the concept of prototype or, or a prototype phase. Uh, uh, the, uh, the idea is there is a multidimensional forms that contains uh, calls uh, preface that contains all possible variants of lattice uh, for the particular material. And uh, you may ask me, and where is the f uh, Vedic system of sounds? <laughs> uh, 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 the Vedic system of sounds consists of four levels. <laughs> uh, the, uh, first level is uh, para sounds uh, uh, is a transcendental sounds uh, we can feel it anyway. Uh, Pashyandi is a sound of our desires he connected with brain. Madhyama is a sound of the mind and uh, these three uh, levels are out of our three dimensional re reality. And Vaikari is a material sound. Uh, uh, that what we hear. Uh, the one of the ideas is the high level of sounds control uh, on uh, low levels. For example, Madhyama sounds organize the material sounds of Vaigari. Uh, and the tra tra transformation in the three-dimensional space occurs uh, through rotation of uh, four-dimensional objects and they change uh, its section or projection uh, by our uh, three-dimensional reality. Uh, thus, there is a certain multi-dimensional uh, lattice which contains possible variants of lattice and three-dimensional reality. Uh, uh, and I want to share with another example uh, where we can see such interrelation. The comp. Uh, bees began to build the comb from different parts of the hive. Uh, where they finish, there is no any gaps uh, in the center. A very, very accurate walk. How it possible? As, uh, as we know, uh, they don't use any instruments. Uh, the possible interpretation is the existence of the multidimensional form of comb. Uh, and there is only one example. Uh, there are many um, uh, more such examples in the nature, and uh, this is a good opportunity to collaboration. And uh, finally, in conclusion, uh, there is a correlation between uh, the crystallography and the Vedic system of sounds, that transformation in materials occurs uh, through uh, four-dimensional uh, space, which is analog of the uh, sounds of Madhyama level. Um, so, thank you. Question? <laughs> <Yeah>. Too complicated, <laughs> I think. <laughs>
And I think um, it illustrates the way that information, which is ultimately what sound is, it's a vibration containing information, has the opportunity to interact with physical systems. So it may be something to tie your research with some of the other work that is going on with the other physicists. Maybe but thank sense. you very much. <laughs> <laughs>
So, um, Mike, the question which came to me as a clinician uh, was, if it works on a purely on a metaphysical level, how is that? There are so many studies being published um, on uh, effects of meditation on depression. That was actually very intriguing for me, and that's why I started my search. And um, you know, despite its commonplace uh, in India, I grew up in India, and I. Uh, uh, the underlying mecha mechanisms of monotone repetition of uh, specific sounds mentioned in the Vedic literatures have not been studied. Um, so, mantra uh, is actually is part integral part of Vedic literatures, and manana uh, trayate iti mantraha, meaning that which delivers the mind upon repeated utterance. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> Mantra in the Vedic literatures, um, it can be cha read, chanted, or meditated upon, and each method yields specific results. Um, it, and uh, Vedic literatures are very specific about each sound and how you chant it. And uh, especially the silent um, meditation has been extensively published, uh, but the, the monotone audible uh, repetition has not been published. So. To address these, um, uh, I started studying a vast body of alternative medical literature which quantify corresponding somatic physiological parameters associated with uh, metaphysical um, conscious experience, which itself cannot be measured. Um, so uh, the Vedic literatures have, they, they regard, they perceive the human system as a continuous matrix of four systems. The consciousness matrix, you have the psychological matrix, then you have the physiological matrix, and the structural matrix. And e each of them are interconnected and intraconnected. And uh, uh, the di different elements, they have subtypes in these four domains, and all of them are networked. So, um, <clears throat> so in basically, is it purely the effects of mantra chanting? Is it purely metaphysical or actually it, it's squarely in, this, in, the, in the realm of biophysics, uh, physics of the body, is something what I was very curious to study. So are there any quantifiable physiological effects of vibrating a mantra? Um, this is Srila Prabhupada, uh, actually, uh, who is a great inspiration for me. And <coughs> he said that spiritual wellness cannot be divorced from physical, emotional, and mental equilibrium. And um, ultimately, as a physician, um, um, my basic uh, uh, duty is to keep people away from uh, becoming chronically ill. The prevention is the first um, duty of uh, a physis physician. And uh, uh, today's uh, medical model is, it's actually I call post-material science um, integrative model to protect well-being of the healthy actually it has strong semblance to the, the to the vedic system of medicine uh, it also has four different realms the biological realm the social realm the spiritual realm and the psychological realm pretty much so all domains of human system again uh, as i pointed out are interdependent and connected state of optimal health is achieved when there is equilibrium in all these domains. And lastly, the spirit, uh, spiritual wellness is included in the World Health Organization definition of optimal health. Many people don't give this um, much importance, but actually spiritual wellness is counted. So modern system of medicine actually has uh, drastically uh, transformed despite a mechanistic model of um, uh, the human body, which we study in medical school. And um, I just tried to get, so I was, I was actually curious um, when I saw the study of Dr. David Wolf, and uh, because I was looking at um, what are the, the most common diseases which were actually treated by meditative practices are psychological diseases. So I came across Dr. Wolf's study and um, talk a little bit of this. Um, Dr. Wolf demonstrated a statistically significant reduction in depression scale in subjects who chanted the Hare Krishna Mahamantra for 30, 30 minutes a day for four weeks, and the effect persisted 
um, even after cessation of the practice. Um, so uh, if you just see, um, is there a laser pointer here? So, is the, so basically, this study lasted eight weeks, and um, the first, and uh, they, they divided the 93 participants into three separate arms, and uh, all of them were uh, underwent a standardized training uh, curriculum, and they were trained in the audible repetition of the mantra, and they 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 did depression questionnaires at at weeks at on day zero on day 30 and day 60. Uh, we saw that the, the Maha Mantra arm, they, the depression scales drastically dropped uh, to a very statistically uh, significant degree and the p-value was less than 0 0.01. And at this fourth, four week point, they stopped the uh, practice. They again conducted a survey on week number eight. And they saw that the depression scale didn't go back to the original, but it, but it actually came, um, it went up a little bit, but it didn't go back. And uh, this was very striking because medications are not like that. Uh, you, you, if, a, if a depressed person actually stops taking uh, medication, his probably uh, there's a risk of suicide even. Uh, but this does not happen in this uh, you know, spiritually based intervention. And in the, in the case of, uh, they also gave um, the other group an alternate Sanskrit sound without spiritual connection. And they also chanted for 30 minutes. And at, um, at day, on day zero, they, they, they actually measured the depression scale. And on day 30, it went down, but it was not statistically significant. And when they stopped at uh, day 30, and they again checked it on day 60, actually the depression scale went back up to the baseline. And people who did nothing, the control arm who did nothing, there was no, actually there was no, it was no, no effect on the depression scale at all. So, um, so we know that uh, depression is connected with many medical illnesses, and this, is, this was what stimulated my interest. Uh, they followed, in a, one study, they followed over 4,500 men and um, uh, they were six, more than 65 years of age and uh, we, they saw that um, every increase of five points in the depression scale actually um, it, it increased the heart attack risk by 15% uh, and they were, all the people who had depression and coronary artery disease had 60% higher death rate. So um, this was the study of Dr. Wolf on stress, and we, they, they observed similar patterns in stress. Uh, even after they actually stopped um, chanting, the, st the stress level did not go back in the Mahamantra arm. And uh, I'm not going to get too much into this because we're running out of time. So, <coughs> so basically, um, is is the question about stress is, is all kinds of stress bad for us? Um, basically, is it detrimental? But actually the fact is only chronic stress is detrimental because in the wild, uh, zebras don't get ulcers. They're, they're actually, uh, they can, they're at imminent danger at every point of time. They can be hunted, they're predators. But they, get, they have mechanisms to actually not let the stress linger on. And um, that's actually, um, very, that, but we are here we are, we are in the most uh, technologically advanced civilization that um, we um, end up getting all chronic diseases. We are uh, basically um, um, masters of stress mismanagement. Um, so uh, the, uh, 24 hours are not enough um, uh, in, and there's always a sense of urgency, like right now I'm in a sense of urgency. Uh, <laughs> So, a lot, so what happens is that I, you lose a loss of discrimination and you make bad choices and you make mistakes and errors. So we know that most of chronic uh, uh, stress is responsible for inflammation and inflammation is the underlying principle for many diseases including, including coronary artery disease, dementia, cancer, diabetes, and the list goes on. So 
This is, uh, what are the, some implications of stress? This is uh, Elizabeth Blackburn. She won the Nobel Prize for inventing telomerase in 1984. And uh, she found that uh, babies who were born to um, pregnant mothers in their, when they were very highly stressed, in their later on in their life, they had a, a higher risk. Um, next. They are a higher risk of cancer and demand uh, cancer mortality because telomerase was lacking and there was lack of there was a loss of genetic information. So if we decrease stress by Maha Mantra, probably we can affect uh, incidence of cancer. So uh, we tested uh, the heart rate variability. So what is heart rate variability? Uh, it is a physiological beat to beat variation in the time interval between heartbeats. And it's the balance of the, uh, of the two systems, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And um, so uh, today we know that uh, heart rate variability has many um, applications in clinical practice. So, um, so people who have a better HRV have a lower incidence of heart attack they have better outcomes uh, with many conditions like depression, diabetes, and um, uh, also people who have established cardiac failure, if uh, they actually increase the HRV, they had better outcomes and better healing of the heart. So, um, so basically, uh, these are the, so what are some visual representation of emotions? Uh, we actually know when your heart rhythms are haphazard, associated with frustration, anxiety, worry, irritation, negative emotions, they, um, they are associated with uh, impaired uh, brain function. And on the other hand, with people who have um, more regular waves um, of um, heart rhythm, they actually have better brain function. They're able to function better. They're able to uh, have better functional memory, make uh, good decisions uh, when it comes to uh, self-care. So this is the study we published. and. Um, so uh, the, the basic focus of the study was, does trained attention practice of audible chanting meditation affect vagal tone as measured by HRV, heart rate variability, which is an indicator of self-regulatory strength and chronic illness. So we use the Hare Krishna mantra because Dr. Wolf used the same. And uh, uh, so um, I'm going to just, uh, so this is the experimental design. Uh, so we had two arms and uh, the experimental arm vibrated the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra for 30 minutes for a period of six weeks and the placebo arm uh, chanted a placebo sound which did not have spiritual connection for 30 minutes and at four week point they switched to the Maha Mantra. So, so they were randomly selected um, they, and um, I don't have time to go into these slides. I wish I had more time. <laughs> I'm going to run through these. So we, we saw that uh, people who, um, th who chanted the Hare Krishna Mantra, the, all the, uh, these, these numbers are logarithmic values of frequencies. And we saw that uh, the experimental group had statistically significant results. And when the placebo group at four week, they shifted, they switched to the Maha Mantra, they had an increase in HRV. So um, uh, basically, I want to stop here because uh, I, I don't have the, but uh, we, I, tomorrow I'll be having uh, a 30 minute discussion. So if you're welcome to come to that, that thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Vena Gopal, and uh, my apologies for inducing stress. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to invite Bob and Josh back for more jokes. Um, but as he mentioned, he is um, part of uh, one of the workshops tomorrow. That's all in their program. So if you're interested in this particular aspect of his work and in kind of health and Ayurveda, it'll be part of that session, isn't it? Yes. So that'll be on tomorrow. Um, I'd now like to invite um, Natika um, Parmar, who got her PhD at UCLA. Um, she's now at uh, California State University, um, and her particular speciality is cancer biology. And uh, the title of her paper is DNA and Consciousness. Please, Natika. Thank, 
Good afternoon, everyone. And first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for accepting my abstract and allowing me to present. This is a wonderful August gathering, and I'm going to load you with a lot of molecular information here. So please be ready for it, but I'll end it on a sweet note, which you'll be very familiar with. So please bear with me for all the technical jargon that I'm about to use here. It'll be very simple. It'll really not be too technical for you. So the title of my talk is DNA and Consciousness. How many of you have heard of the word DNA? Okay, I'm looking for those who've never heard of it because that's gonna be a problem. All right, so before I present my talk, there are certain disclaimers I'd like to make because uh, I am uh, formally not trained in the areas of psychology and consciousness. I'm a hardcore molecular biologist and I do not conduct any research on consciousness. In fact, all the researchers here were absolutely brilliant. I'd love to learn a little bit more from them. And secondly, uh, the, this presentation is very informational in nature, and the facts are already known, so what's so new about it? What I've done is I've analyzed these facts with a magnifying glass, and I've teased out some of the uh, findings I've discovered, and that's what I'm gonna present to you. So, the outline of my talk is fairly simple. Uh, I will give you a brief introduction about DNA, exactly what DNA is, uh, talking about properties, and then touching a little bit on the central dogma of molecular biology. And finally, I'll get to the crux of the, uh, my talk, which is, is DNA conscious? Does it have free will? And so forth. And finally, is our genetic code predetermined is it destined? Are we destined for certain things to be done, or, or can we change our destiny? And finally, we'll talk on uh, the Vedic concept of consciousness, which is very interesting. So the DNA, as we all know, is regarded as the blueprint of life. And DNA is uh, present in each one of our 23 pairs of chromosomes. So on the left slide shows you a fantastic graphic that every student is expected to know today. That is the double helical structure of DNA, which is basically what we are made up of. And the second panel shows you a karyotype, which is basically a blood cell which is taken, and the cell is lysed, which is broken, and the chromosomes are smeared on a glass slide. And typically, this is what the doctors do if they want to find out that a baby is uh, destined to have a genetic disease and so forth. So all these chromosomes are actually loaded with DNA. So DNA is a very, very important molecule in the body. So the word DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It is the one of the two kinds of nucleic acids. The first is DNA and the second is RNA. And it, of course, it's the blueprint of life. Uh, the DNA was first identified in 1860s by the Swiss chemist Maisha, and then later Shargaff and Levin revealed the structure through its primary chemical components in the 1940s. Of course, the Nobel Prize was eventually given to Watson and Crick, who actually solved the DNA structure in 1953, but the information that they received from the study of Franklin and Wilkins was absolutely instrumental uh, for them to devise the double helical structure of DNA. So DNA is astounding. I'm gonna leave you with these uh, uh, numerical facts which are absolutely astounding. I've been studying DNA for 25 years and when I see these numbers, it's absolutely amazing how wonderful nature can be. Just to give you a little bit of facts here. The human genome is composed of 3.2 billion base pairs and we have two copies of each of our chromosomes. So we are carrying 6.4 billion base pairs of DNA within us. Every human cell has DNA, except the mature red blood cell and certain quantified cells of the nails and the hair and so forth. Pretty much every cell has DNA. Humans share 95% of DNA with primates, monkeys and gorillas, and astoundingly, 50% with bananas. And what's interesting to me as a molecular biologist is 99.9% .9 of all of us in this room are identical. It's the 0.1% difference which makes us all extremely unique, which is very challenging to grasp. And the DNA is huge, but only one to 3% of the total DNA codes for proteins. So what's the remaining 97% doing? It's not junk. It used to be called junk, but now it is known as regulatory DNA. And if unraveled, this is the big part, if a single cell is broken open 
and the entire DNA is unraveled, each DNA would measure six feet long. And each one of us has 100 trillion cells. So you do the math. Take out the DNA from each one of those 100 trillion cells and guess how long would that be? That would be several trips to the sun and back. And that's the amount of DNA that we are carrying in our body. It is compacted about 200,000 fold. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have much more respect for your DNA, considering how great it is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the properties and not get too much into the science. These properties are very important to understand why DNA can be regarded as a conscious molecule. So the chemical, mechanical, biological, informational, and electrical pop properties. So chemically, it is a double helical structure composed of three separate components, a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. The helix is anti-parallel in nature. That's a double helical structure, which pretty much every student knows now. The, the backbone is composed of sugar and phosphates, and there are four bases which are lined internally, and these are stacked on top of each other like a staircase. So this DNA has polarity. One strand runs from five prime to three prime, while the other strand runs in the opposite direction. And one important feature about DNA, without which none of us would survive, is it can melt. That means the two strands can come apart, and they can go back, come apart, go back. And that is very critical for the DNA to duplicate itself. Of course, the DNA itself can be influenced by pH and solvents and temperatures in the environment. And of course, it can also be cross-linked and modified, which is very important in uh, today's health industry for delivering drugs and so forth. So in terms of uh, forms of DNA, we have three major forms of DNA, the A, B, and Z. And physiologically, in each one of our cells, it is the B form which is most predominant. The A and Z forms can occur depending on conditions of pH and salt in the cell. Mechanically, DNA is a very flexible molecule. It has high curvature, it can be bent without breaking, and it can be tightly wound too. And these dynamics are very, very important because DNA is consistently interacting with proteins. And so for a protein to interact with DNA, it's very important that the DNA is very, very flexible in nature. Likewise, DNA can also interact with electromagnetic radiation. DNA can absorb light, Depending on whether DNA is double-stranded or single-stranded, it will have different capacities to absorb light. And this is very important to us in our experimentation when we, when we are dealing with isolation of DNA and looking at its quality. Electrically, this is a very new field, which I'm really not an expert in. This is known as uh, nanobiotechnology, where DNA is found to have insulating properties, and it can be uh, placed between two uh, electrodes where it will function as a molecule which is capable of transmitting information. And finally, that's where I come in. This is what I study. What are the informational properties of DNA? And does anyone know what this table is? Although I've written it there, this is the code of life. This is the genetic code, which is basically a combination of different nucleotides in a triplet form, which will be converted into amino acids, which will be converted into proteins. And basically, how proteins function within us is going to determine how healthy we are going to be. And biologically, DNA is a very, very active molecule. It duplicates itself. It can transcribe into an RNA molecule, and the RNA can be converted into a protein molecule. And this is where I mentioned that I've been trained in a hardcore molecular sciences. This can be very technical, but all these parameters of DNA are very important in determining how DNA is functioning as the blueprint of our life. So. Let's talk a little bit about the central dogma of molecular biology. If even in molecular biology, there is a basic tenet on which everything is based. So essentially, we have three molecules, the DNA, the RNA, and the protein. And theoretically, this is only on paper, DNA can be converted to RNA, RNA can be converted to protein, and theoretically, protein should be able to be converted to DNA, but this never happens. What essentially happens is the central dogma. DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is the intermediate molecule between DNA and protein, and RNA is converted into protein itself. 
So this was a central dogma which persisted for several years because initially it was thought that there is only one arrow, DNA going to RNA and RNA going into protein. And this dogma existed for several years. Later, this dogma was violated extensively through the discovery of various new enzymes, namely the discovery of reverse transcriptase, which is basically an enzyme which is found in viruses uh, such as retroviruses, which cause HIV, uh, the HIV which causes AIDS. And essentially, what ret uh, retroviruses showed was RNA can in fact be converted back to DNA. So a new arrow was placed in the central dogma which shows that RNA can revert back to DNA. And this of course opened up the whole new theory of whether DNA is the origin of life or is it really RNA the ori origin of life. And that debate is consistently ongoing. So second discovery was the uh, uh, observation of long non-coding RNA molecules and this is an, a whole area in itsel itself essentially. Thirdly, there was a discovery of prions uh, which suggested that uh, the genetic information is not passed on by DNA but genetic information can also be passed on by proteins which was a huge discovery. So I'm going to skip these. These are just graphics which show you how the central dogma was violated by various discoveries. So is DNA conscious? So the whole important point is how do we define consciousness? So for consciousness, it is important that it be autopoetic, that means self-maintaining, dynamic, and evolving. And all these three parameters, as based on the properties I showed you, are actually shown by DNA. And consciousness is constructed of its own constituents, such as emotions, perceptions, and so forth. So where does DNA come in? So according to Freud, the three levels of awareness or consciousness, which I have teased out and sort of corroborated with the way I study DNA, there's a pre-conscious stage, which I consider to be a double-stranded DNA, the conscious stage to be the single-stranded DNA, and the unconscious stage to be known as the triple helix, which is a, a very unique form of DNA. Likewise, according to the Mandukya Upanishad in the Vedic conception, there are four phases, the waking phase, the dreaming phase, the deep sleep, and the pure absolute phase. So for all the uh, first three phases, I have a molecule which I can say is corresponding to these three phases, but I don't have a molecule which corresponds to the highest phase, which is the phase of pure absolute. So does DNA have its free will? I'm going to ask you a question now. If you had a choice of becoming old in life or getting cancer, what would you choose? Okay, that's exactly what DNA is doing. DNA has free will. Given a choice, DNA makes proteins which will allow it to become old rather than causing it to co uh, carcinogenesis or cause cancer. Likewise, DNA codes for enzymes which will degrade itself. DNA has also capacity of coding enzymes which can fix its errors. And finally, DNA can also encode an enzyme which was just touched upon by uh, Venugopal, which says that uh, uh, DNA has a problem of, uh, it's known as the end replication problem, but DNA makes enzymes which will actually prevent that problem from occurring, but unfortunately the enzyme that causes it loses its activity over a period of time. So DNA has a capacity to eradicate itself, so it does have free will. DNA has a capacity through proteins to chew itself up, so it does have free will. DNA can also correct its own aberrations, so it does have free will. And finally, DNA can also impact how the cells divide, how the cells age, and so forth. So it does have a lot of free will. And of course, DNA is a very malleable molecule, which is very important for it to have a free will. So is DNA conscious? The uh, important point is our consciousness can be changed. So if consciousness, consciousness is dictated by the DNA code, can the code be influenced to uh, impact our consciousness? That is a big question. So output of the code, although the code itself cannot be changed, but the output can be changed. So when I say output, that means mutations of the DNA, either through exposure through cigarette smoke or ultraviolet radiation and so forth, or what we call epigenetics, which means modifying the DNA without really modifying its sequence, which can actually change our behavior, which I'm going to show you right towards the end if time permits. And this field, which causes change in the DNA, 
uh, how the DNA is decorated without changing the actual sequence is known as epigenetics. And this has gained tremendous impetus in today's molecular world because it, it reflects how our environment can really impact how we think, how we perceive, how we respond, and so forth. So I'm going to skip these two slides, essentially. And uh, towards the end, I'll just like to mention that our DNA is extremely complex. We share our DNA with lots of organisms, and we are extremely complex in our consciousness. But there are other organisms who have much more number of genes than us, but essentially they are not at the same level of consciousness like us. And then we have a whole series of another organisms, if we can call them organisms, known as viruses to contend with. Now, towards the end, I'm going to give you a little bit of a Vedic concept of consciousness, where consciousness can be influenced by internal factors, such as karmic reactions, or external factors, which could be very uh, large in number. So internal factors are the previous conceptions of life, which are basically the material modes of nature. So the question is, is there any evidence of genes here? Are genes going to influence our, uh, uh, how our consciousness is dictated? The answer is, I don't know. That's something that has to be done more. Secondly, the external factors which influence consciousness, this is what we call the four S's. Sadhana, which is prayer. Sadachar, which is our behavior. Sangha, which is our association. And finally, seva, which is a service. These are external factors which are influencing our consciousness. So according to the Vedic concept of consciousness, the soul, the consciousness is actually the symptom of the soul. And how big is the soul? Srila Prabhupada's right, the soul is one ten thousand part of the tip of the human air. And I did some calculations here to find out that the average size of the hair tip is about 20 microns. And theoretically, the size of the soul is 2 nanometers. So if you do the math, the DNA helix comes out to be exactly the size of the soul, which is 2 nanometers. So I'm going to end uh, with these last four or five slides, I'll try to make it quick. I've tried to compare the molecular concept with the Vedic concept, and this is where I found some very interesting uh, uh, s uh, s uh, sort of similarities here. According to the molecular concept, the primary progenitor is DNA. According to the Vedic concept, the primary progenitor is God, whom we call Krishna, the most attractive. According to molecular concept, the secondary proge progenitors are the four bases of DNA, A, T, G, and C. And according to Vedas, the secondary progenitors are the Chaturvyuha, Shankarshan, Anirudh, Pradyumna, and Vasudev. Likewise, the central dogma of molecular biology relies on the trinity of DNA, RNA, and protein. According to the Vedas, the trinity are Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh. Likewise, the prominent form of the nucleic acid which is involved in the maintenance of everything in the cell is the RNA molecule. The RNA is found in three primary forms, M, T, and R. If you look who is responsible for maintenance of the universe, that's Vishnu, who's present in three forms, Karano Dakshai Vishnu, Shiro Dakshai Vishnu, and Garbho Dakshai Vishnu. Finally, the energetic code is a triplet code. That's the genetic code. And likewise, when we talk about Krishna, his energies are three, internal, external, and marginal. This is where the anomaly is. Right now, there are 22 different amino acids which make up the protein. And proteins are basically what drives the cells to live. According to the Sankhya philosophy, the material cosmos is made up of 24 elements. So if anyone is interested, there is a need to find out those two remaining amino acids. <laughs> Finally, the, the genetic code is made up of 64 different codons. That means these 64 are basically going to determine what your amino acids are. And guess what? Krishna has 64 transcendental qualities. So I'm going to end here and leave it for you to judge for yourself. DNA is the blueprint of life. DNA is conscious. Does it have free will? That can be controversial. And finally, is it conscious? Can the DNA be changed as a result of diet? meditation and prayer. Yes, there is extensive evi evidence that our uh, external influence, which is prayer and meditation and mantra chanting, can actually impact our DNA and change its profile drastically for the good. So I will end here by uh, uh, showing you a cake here, how I really think of DNA as DNA is basically the flour and the oil and the baking powder and the sugar, which makes up the cake. And depending on how we decorate the cake, 
we can actually go towards better health or detrimental health. For instance, the fruits on the cake can be regarded as the prayers. The walnuts can be the impact of the meditation. The icing, which is just butter and sugar, very detrimental for diabetic patients, can be regarded as very unhealthy. And the candles, depending on how many we have on the cake, can be very detrimental for our internal health. With this, I'll end my talk. And please forgive me for going a little bit over time. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, your point about uh, you know, sharing 99.9 something percent of uh, our DNA um, is very interesting. I once saw the slogan, you are unique, just like everyone else. <laughs> okay, um, the final speaker in this session is Alexander uh, Zalivan, who um, is a PhD in psychiatry and also uh, an MD. Um, and he's currently a teacher of psychiatry and addictology um, at Omstate uh, Medical, uh, Medical uh, University. And his topic <coughs> is clinics and dynamics of suicidal behavior and rehabilitation of borderline mental patients in different variants of post-suicidal period. Thank you so much. I would like to appreciate the possibility to speak here and uh, all of you for you to come. Uh, actually, at the my place now it is a deep night. <laughs> and uh, the previous speakers were describing which gunas would predominate. So I would try to follow the text and to overcome this tamaguna, rajaguna, and go to uh, Vedic descri descriptions. Uh, it was very interesting for me to um, find parallels between a uh, Vedic approach and uh, modern scientific approach to suicidal behavior. So, next slide. Oh. Okay. And this comparison will um, be stressing for all the speech. This is the table of contents and some basic points I would like to speak on. Uh, we will compare uh, the traditional approach to the suicide. Uh, on the traditional approach, we uh, mentioned uh, the thinking that Srila Prabhupada was um, giving to us. Uh, and it is based on Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita as it is, and Srisha Panishad. Uh, modern approach uh, bases on uh, psychiatrical researches. Uh, then I will describe some factors uh, and uh, dynamics of su suicidal behavior. Uh, due to our speech about consciousness, uh, we will describe uh, what exactly is the basis for a person to make a decision whether to go uh, for a suicide or to escalate his consciousness, the level of living. And then uh, I will say some words about my personal investigations and uh, for sure we need to settle down the rehabilitation programs. So, uh, what can we find in Vedas about suicide? We can say that Atmaha is stated in Shisha Panishad, Mantra 3. Uh, we know that one who neglects the purpose of human life goes to the darkest hellish planets. <laughs> Excuse me, the topic is quite serious. <laughs> I, would I would not like to spoil the mood, but <laughs> one who has forgotten his uh, relations with the Lord uh, is considered to have committed his spiritual suicide. So, another uh, reason described in Vedas is a desire to merge with Brahman, one who merges with uh, impersonal ideas. And another is due to the, the cause of Abhinivesha is one of the layers of subtle body. And it is uh, deeply consisting our inter and in it influences our decisions. It gives us a subtle fear that uh, influences our of our life. And Tamisra, it is, a it is a reason of anger and envy to enjoy the material world 
as the, the way as the Lord, the Lord does, but we cannot. So the envy and anger is there. Tamisra and Hatamisra, Tamas, Moha, Mahamoha, they are described in Shemad Bhagavatam. So the only the solution is given to appeal to Creator. It is given in Bhagavad Gita, and you cannot overcome him. And the recipe, uh, recipe is to understand that the Lord is sitting in one's heart and he is the best friend. Well, the, it is some uh, statistical uh, numbers, figures that uh, are present in Russian Federation, and it shows that um, uh, number of suicide due to 100,000 people goes down from 33 in 2006 to 25. It's in Russia. Russia is the second uh, country after Lithuania. And USA, I checked uh, recently, it is the 27th position. It's a low rate suicidal country. Well, it shows that uh, uh, mostly suffering is a teenagers and uh, people after 55. Uh, the statistics shows that about one million people die every year for recent 20 years from suicide. It is the second leading cause of death among young people and old globally by statistics uh, of this year, World Health Organ Organization. If to seek to the beginning of the teachings of suicidology, we can say that it was uh, stated um, by Emil Turkheim, 1897. He wrote the book, Suicide and Social Etude. And let us remember this name, uh, we will mention it at the end of our presentation. Then uh, here in USA, Norman Farberow and Edwin Schneidman in 61, 1961, they wrote a book, Cry for Help. And it was quite earlier than in Russia, 74, 1974 and 1980s, Aina Ambrumova wrote uh, the book, Suicidal Behavior. And uh, in 1994, uh, it was a remake, 108 uh, years later by Lester. So now it is a widespread uh, system of uh, assistance. It includes hotlines, it includes mental hospitals and crisis center. Well, let us speak about uh, some factors that could cause the, this, uh, I suppose, mistake of decision. Uh, modern psychiatry is uh, looking for a person as a complex of uh, body, subtle body, including mental and intelligence. And the uh, World Health Organization also mm, started to seek for a spiritual health. Uh, doctor mentioned it in his speech before. So we can wo uh, see towards the biological uh, markers. There are 76 biomarkers of suicidal behavior, they found it. Yes, uh, there are some somatogenic organic factors that uh, could cause. They include uh, incurable diseases, cos cosmetic slags, and uh, some organic uh, uh, disorders uh, that uh, change the function of the brain. It could be trauma, it could be vascular and toxic injuries. Other uh, so layer of life is social life, and of course, the attitude to a person in his family, in his surroundings, and the attitude to the life in general in society influences how precious life is or not. And uh, of course, mental patients uh, that have serious disorders like schizophrenia or paranoid disorders or additional or maybe affectional disorders, all of them are in a group of risk. So here is a portrait portrait of, pers of personality who is uh, a serious group of risk. Uh, when we were uh, walking around this campus, uh, Morali Gopal, he said that uh, there are mm, one person among the students uh, once at two years who goes away. So he is, it is a mm, male. Uh, women tend to keep their life. They do efforts but do not finish. He's a teenager, 
his bodily constitution is dysplastic, his educational level is not so high, his family was not uh, full, he had one parent or did not have parents at all. Is it spread or not? That is the situation. Uh, he has uh, serious uh, is isolation, he has no an intimate friends, and also he has not uh, any experience, experience of selfless responsibility. He has not a uh, taste for austerities. He cannot handle it. Uh, that would uh, cause uh, in our later talks when uh, there will be a need to decide whether I should go for my pain or should I handle it for somehow, for some reason. So these people have lacks of this reason to live. Well, uh, uh, the dynamics of suicidal behavior is listed here. They are starting from just isolation tendencies and through antivital thoughts uh, they come to uh, suicidal thoughts and then come to external. First they were inside, then they go for practice. Any ideas just grow. And we need uh, to know this uh, tendency just for rehabilitation because we will put it upside down. Then we will ask a person to drop his weapon. Then we will ask him to change the, his plans. And back, 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 back to the very deep consciousness. And uh, modern approach uh, describes this personality for certain qualities. Their hopelessness mostly, their uh, psychalgia, it is a mental pain. Yeah, and uh, he has uh, serious mm, problems with understanding what to do and lack of willpower to overcome the impulsive tendency to finish what he was deciding to do. And uh, if we look from traditional approach, it is not just bad karma. <laughs> it is Ad harma, it is a lack of understanding what a person have to do to his bodily concept, to his born uh, possibilities, and to his spiritual duty. Well, after he finishes, uh, post-suicide typology was based on uh, different three points mainly. Did patient understand? Did uh, the situation change? And did he refuse to finish the attempt? So there are four types of post-suicidal period. I was uh, trying to help them in inpatient department. Here are some figures. The rehabilitation um, was successful. There is a psychometric scales, but that is not the main point. The main point is that traditional approach, approach gives us a uh, possibility to speak with the soul, with internal, uh, essence of a person because uh, crisis mm, a person uh, internally cannot live as he did before and externally has he has nobody to go to speak with that is the situation and this is a cri crisis and this crisis ca is a point of desperation actually it is a point when a person can level up when a person can uh, progress extremely fast, he has nothing to take care of in this material world actually at this point. But uh, when he has lack of intelligence, when he has no mercy from outside, when he has, no, uh, has a lack of mm, some genetic or other material, we would say, his decision could be influenced by Tamagun by the ignorance, by the lack of knowledge, we would say. So it is a challenge. It is a challenge for a person who would assist him. And uh, of course, <coughs> this situation as a personal loss was described in a very nice uh, seminar of His Grace Ravindos Rupa Prabhu. He allowed to mention him here. And uh, as a final, I would compare modern approach and Vedic approach. They are more or less similar. Uh, with the lack of time, I would not uh, go to the details, but 
what is the main? Uh, modern psychiatrists say that, and suicidology in particular, they say that <coughs> complex of methods should be mentioned. We should uh, help for social situation, we, we should go for internal help, if a person re receives it, reciprocates normally. And we also we should uh, fix the internal neurobiological substances, we should use uh, me medical drugs. In spite of that, uh, uh, spiritual guides uh, say that uh, if social rehabilitation is effective and if spiritual practice is quite strong, that means that a person has a deep, deep internal understanding that I am not this body, it is easy to understand. But I, how is it possible to understand that I am not that mind that is painful? That is the point. That is the point. So if, the, if it is possible somehow, and that is the challenge for assistant, then person can grow up very fast. And we have an example. We have an example. You remember that um, Durgheim, he is a founder of, of modern suicidology. There was a conversation between Durgheim and Srila Prabhupada. It was in 1974. I found it uh, yesterday, <laughs> yeah, M maybe two days before w when I was preparing these approaches, modern and traditional. So a representative of m modern, <laughs> if you would say your game is modern, uh, he comes to Srila Prabhupada and say w his philosophy. And uh, Srila Prabhupada did not uh, estimate it is very high. After that, he said uh, that you are not a body, you are not a, you are a spiritual soul, you are part of the Lord, and your eternal uh, loving relationships are with the service of the Lord. He had to repeat it several times. And after that, uh, we know the quote. Uh, Durgaim said, it is a very good news that I am not the body who has the soul. Rather, I am a spiritual soul that has his bodily experience. So that's it. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you very much. Alexander, thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, I want to give a big thanks to uh, all our contributors there. And again, our apologies that we pressed you to uh, presents uh, so much information, so much knowledge, and so much understanding into just 15 minutes. And particularly, I have to say, I appreciate that those who are speaking in uh, something that's not their first language, and I think they um, deserve our appreciation. <coughs> Some of these topics um, will be carried on tomorrow, as we heard, in the breakout sessions. So you will have a chance to pick and choose some of the uh, uh, topics that are of most interest to you um, and get a chance to meet um, the speakers and discuss anything further. But we're going to take a, a break now. We've got 15 minutes, and then we come back for the final session of the day. So 15 minutes from now, that'll be uh, half past. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>